Tell him about yourself. Along with the king. And the hunter? He. Oh, you come as carefully upon your honor. It is now stopped well. Get thee to bed, Francisco. For this relief, much thanks. It is bitter cold. I am sick at heart. Have you had quiet guard? Not a mouse stirring. Well, good night. If you do meet Horatio and Marcellus, the rivals of my watch, bid them make haste. I think I hear them. Fan, ho, who is there? Friends to this ground. Please run to the day. Give you a good night. Oh, farewell, honest soldier. Who has relieved you? Bernardo has my place. Give you a good night. Uh, Bernardo. Say, what is Horatio there? A piece of him. Welcome, Horatio. Welcome, good Marcellus. What does this thing appear again tonight? I have seen nothing. Horatio says it is but our fantasy. Will not let belief take hold of him, touching this dreaded sight twice seen of us. Therefore, I have entreated him along with us to watch the minutes of this night. Till again this apparition come, he may approve our eyes and speak to it. Dust, dust, twill not appear. Sit down a while and let us once again assail your ears that are so fortified against our story what we two knights have seen. Well, sit we down. Let us hear Bernardo speak of this. Last night of all. When yon same star that's westward from the pole had made his course to illume that part of heaven where now it burns, Marcellus and myself, the bell then beating one... Yes. Break thee off. Look where it comes again. In the same figure like the king that's dead. Art a scholar. Speak to it, Horatio. Was it not like the king? Mark it, Horatio. Most like. It harrows me with fear and wonder would be spoke to. Question it, Horatio. What art thou that usurps this time of night, together with that fair and warlike form in which the majesty of very Denmark did sometimes march? By heaven, I charge thee, speak. It is offended. See, it stalks away. Stay. Speak. Speak. I charge thee, speak. It is gone and will not answer. Oh, now, Horatio, you tremble and look pale. Is not this something more than fantasy? What think you want? Before my God, I might not misbelieve without the sensible and true avouch of mine own eyes. Is it not like the king? As thou art to thyself. Such was the very armor he had on when he, the ambitious Norway, combated. So frowned he once when in an angry pal he smote the sledded Polax on the ice. It is strange. Last twice before, and jump at this dead hour, with Marshal Stork had he gone by our watch. In what particular thought to work, I know not. But in the gross and scope of my opinion, this bodes some strange eruption to our state. Good, now sit down and tell me, he that knows, why this same strict and most observant watch so nightly toils the subject of the land, and why such daily cast of brazen cannon and foreign mart for implements of war. Why such impressive shipwrights whose sore task does not divide the Sunday from the week? What might be taught that this sweaty haste doth make the night joint laborer with the day? Who is that can inform me? That can I. At least the whisper goes so. Our last king, whose image even but now appeared to us, was, as you know, by fought in brass of Norway, that had pricked on by a most emulate pride, dared to the combat, in which our valiant Hamlet, for so this side of our known world esteemed him, did slay this fought in brass who by a sealed compact, well ratified by law and heraldry, did forfeit with his life all those his lands which he stood seized of to the conqueror, against the which a moiety competent was gauged by our king, which had returned to the inheritance of Fortinbras had he been vanquisher, as by the same covenant and carriage of the article designed, his fell to Hamlet. Now, sir, young Fortinbras, of unimproved metal, hot and full, hath in the skirts of Norway here and there sharked up a list of landless resolutes for food and diet to some enterprise that hath a stomach it, which is no other, as it doth well appear unto our state, but to recover of us by strong hand and terms compulsative those forced lands so by his father lost. And this, I take it, is the main motive of our preparations, the source of this our watch, and the chief head of this post-haste and roamage in the land. I think it be no other but e'en so. Well may it sort that this portentous figure comes armed through our watch so like the king that was and is the question of these wars. A mote it is to trouble the mind's eye. In the most high and palmy state of Rome, a little ere the mightiest Julius fell, the grave stood tenantless, and the sheeted dead did squeak and gibber in the Roman streets. The stars with trains of fire and dews of blood, disasters in the sun. 
and the moist star upon whose influence Neptune's empire stands was sick almost a doomsday with eclipse. And even the light precursor of fierce events as harbingers preceding still the fates and prologue to the omen coming on have heaven and earth together demonstrated unto our climatures and countrymen. But so, behold, lo, it comes again. I'll cross it, though it blast me. Stay, illusion! If thou hast any sound or use of voice, speak to me. If there be any good thing to be done that may to thee do ease and grace to me, speak to me. If thou art privy to thy country's fate, which happily for knowing may avoid, oh, speak. Or if thou hast abhorred in thy life extorted treasure in the womb of earth, for which they say you spirits oft walk in death, speak of it. Stay and speak. Stop him, Marcellus. I strike him with my party, sir. Move him on us, Tam. Just here. Just here. He's gone. I do it wrong, being so majestical to offer it this show of violence. For it is as the air invulnerable, and our vein blows malicious mockery. It was about to speak when the cock crew. And it started like a guilty thing about a fearful summons. I have heard the cock that is the trumpet to the morn doth with his lofty and shrill sounding throat awake the god of day, and at his warning, whether in sea or fire, in earth or air, the extravagant and erring spirit hies to his confine, and of the truth herein, this present object made probation. It faded on the crowing of the cock. Some say that ever against that season comes wherein our Saviour's birth is celebrated, the bird of dawning singeth all night long, and then they say no spirit can walk abroad. The nights are wholesome, and then no planet strike, no fairy takes, nor witch hath power to charm. So hallowed and so gracious is the time. So have I heard, and do in part believe it. But look, the morn in russet mantle clad walks o'er the dew of yon high eastern hill. Break we our watch up, and by my advice, let us impart what we have seen tonight unto young Hamlet. For upon my life, this spirit dumb to us will speak to him. Do you consent we shall acquaint him with it? As needful in our loves, fitting our duty. Let's do it, I pray. And I this morning know where we shall find him most conveniently. Hamlet, our dear brother's death, the memory be green, and that it us be pitied to bear our hearts in grief, and our whole kingdom to be contracted in one brow of woe. Yet, so far hath discretion fought with nature, that we with wisest sorrow think on him, together with the remembrance of ourselves. Therefore, our sometime sister, now our queen, the imperial jointress to this warlike state, have we, as twere, with a defeated joy, with one auspicious and one dropping eye, with mirth in funeral and with dirge in marriage, in equal scale, weighing delight and dole, taken to wife? Nor have we here in barred your better wisdoms, which have freely gone with this affair along. For all our thanks. Now follows that you know young Fortinbras holding a weak supposal of our worth, or thinking by our late dear brother's death our state to be disjoint and out of frame, colleague with the dream of his advantage, he hath not failed to pester us with message, importing the surrender of those lands lost by his father with all bonds of law to our most valiant brother. So much for him, now for ourselves and for this time of meeting. Thus much the business is. We have here writ to Norway, uncle of young Fortinbras, who, impotent and bedrid, scarcely hears of this his nephew's purpose, to suppress his further gate herein, in that the levies, the lists, and full proportions are all made out of his subject. And we here dispatch you, good Cornelius, and you, Voltman, 
for bearing of this greeting to old Norway, giving to you no further personal power to business with the king, more than the scope of these deleted articles allow. Farewell, and let your haste command your duty. In that and all things would we show our duty. We doubt it nothing, heartily farewell. And now, Laertes, what's the news with you? You told us of some suit. What is, Laertes? You cannot speak of reason to the Dane and lose your voice. What wouldst thou beg, Laertes, that shall not be my offer, not thy asking? The head is not more native to the heart, the hand more instrumental to the mouth, than is the throne of Denmark to thy father. What wouldst thou have, Laertes? Dread, my lord, your leave and favour to return to France. From whence, though willingly, I came to Denmark to show my duty in your coronation. Yet now I must confess that duty done, my thoughts and wishes bend again toward France, and bow them to your gracious leave and pardon. Have you your father's leave? What says Polonius? He hath, my lord, run from me my slow leave by laboursome petition, and at last upon his will I sealed my hard consent. I, I do beseech you give him leave to go. Take thy fair hour, Laertes, time be thine and thy best graces spend it at thy will. But now, my cousin Hamlet and my son. A little more than kin, and less than kind. How is it that the clouds still hang on you? Not so, my lord. I am too much of the sun. Good Hamlet, cast thy nighted colour off, and let thine eye look like a friend on Denmark. Do not forever with thy veiled lids seek for thy noble father in the dust. Thou knowest is common. All that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. Aye, madam, it is common. If it be, why seems it so particular with thee? Seems, madam? Nay, it is, I know not, seems. Tis not alone my inky cloak, good mother, nor customary suits of solemn black, nor windy suspiration of forced breath, no, nor the fruitful river in the eye, nor the dejected haviour of the visage, together with all forms, moods, shows of grief that can denote me truly. These indeed seem, for they are actions that a man might play. But I have that within which passeth show, these but the trappings and the suits of woe. Tis sweet and commendable in your nature, Hamlet, to give these morning duties to your father. But you must know, your father lost a father, that father lost, lost his, and the survivor bound in filial obligation for some term to do obsequious sorrow. But to persever in obstinate condonement is of course of impious stubbornness. It is unmanly grief. It shows a will most incorrect to heaven, a heart unfortified, a mind impatient, an understanding simple and unschooled. For what we know must be, and is as common as any the most vulgar thing to sense, why should we, in our peevish opposition, take it to heart? Aye, tis a fault to heaven, a fault against the dead, a fault to nature, to reason most absurd, whose common theme is death of fathers, and who still had cried from the first course till he that died today, this must be so. We pray you, throw to earth this unprevailing woe, and think of us as of a father. For let the world take note, you are the most immediate to our throne, and with no less nobility of love than that which dearest father bears his son, do I impart towards you. For your intent in going back to school in Wittenberg, it is most retrograde to our desire, and we beseech you, bend you to remain, here in the cheer and comfort of our eye, our chiefest courtier, cousin, and our son. Let not thy mother lose her prayers, Hamlet. I prithee stay with us. Go not to Wittenberg. I shall in all my best obey you, madam. Why, tis a loving and a fair reply. Be as ourself in Denmark. Madam, come. This gentle and unforced accord of Hamlet sits smiling to my heart. In grace whereof, no jocund health that Denmark drinks today, but the great cannon to the cloud shall tell. And the king's rouse, the heaven shall brute again, re-speaking earth the thunder. Come, away! Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. 
Oh, that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh, God. Oh, God. How weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Fie, aunt. Oh, fie, fie. Tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. That it should come to this, but two months dead, nay, not so much, not two, so excellent a king that was to this Hyperion, to a satyr. So loving to my mother that he might not but team the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth must I remember. Why, she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on. And yet within a month, let me not think on it. Frailty, thy name is woman. A little month. Or ere those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body, like Niobe, all tears, while she, even she, oh God, a beast that once discourse of reason would have mourned longer, married with mine uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I'd Hercules. Within a month, ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing of her galled eyes, she married, oh, most wicked speed, to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets. It is not, nor it cannot come to good, but break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. Hail to your lordship. I'm glad to see you well. Horatio, or I do forget myself. Same, my lord, and your poor servant ever. So, my good friend, I'll change that name with you. But what make you from Wittenberg, Horatio? Marcellus. My good lord. I'm very glad to see you. Good even, sir. My lord. But what in faith make you from Wittenberg? A truant disposition, good my lord. I would not have your enemy say so, nor shall you do mine ear that violence to make it truster of your own report against yourself. <laughs> I know you are no truant. But what is your affair in Elsinore? We'll teach you to drink deep ere you depart. My lord, I came to see your father's funeral. I pray thee do not mock me, fellow student. I think it was to see my mother's wedding. Indeed, my lord, it followed hard upon. Thrift, thrift, Horatio. The funeral baked meats did coldly furnish forth the marriage tables. Would I had met my dearest foe in heaven, or ever I had seen that day, Horatio. My father. Methinks I see. Oh, where, my lord? In my mind's eye, Horatio. I saw him once. He was a goodly king. He was a man. Take him for all in all. I shall not look upon his like again. My lord, I think I saw him yesternight. Saw? Who? My lord, the king, your father. The king, my father? Season your admiration for a while with an attent ear till I may deliver upon the witness of these gentlemen this marvel to you. For God's love, let me hear. Two nights together had these gentlemen, Marcellus and Bernardo, on their watch in the dead waste and middle of the night, been thus encountered. A figure like your father, armed at all points exactly, cap a pay, appears before them, and with solemn march goes slow and stately by them. Thrice he walked by their oppressed and fear-surprised eyes within his truncheon's length whilst they, distilled almost to jelly with the act of fear, stand dumb and speak not to him. This to me in dreadful secrecy in part they did, and I with them the third night kept the watch, where, as they had delivered, both in time, form of the thing, each word made true and good, the apparition comes. I knew your father. These hands are not more like. But where was this? My lord, upon the platform where we watched. Did you not speak to it? My lord, I did, but answer made it none. Yet once methought it lifted up its head and did address itself to motions like as it would speak. But even then, the morning cock crew loud, and at the sound it shrunk in haste away and vanished from our sight. Tis very strange. As I do live, my honoured lord, tis true. And we did think it writ down in our duty to let you know of it. Indeed, indeed, sirs. But this troubles me. Hold you the watch tonight? We do, my lord, we do. Um, say you. Ah, my lord. From top to toe? My lord, from head to head. Then saw you not his face? Oh, yes, my lord. He wore his beaver up. What looked he? Frowningly? A countenance more in sorrow than in anger. 
pale or red. Nay, very pale. And fixed his eyes upon you? Most constantly. I would I'd been there. I would have much amazed you. Very like, very like. Stayed it long? While one with moderate haste might tell a hundred. Longer. Longer. Not when I saw it. His beard was grizzled, no? It was, as I have seen it in his life, a sable silver. I will watch tonight. A chance to walk again. I warrant you it will. If it assume my noble father's person, I'll speak to it, though hell itself should gape and bid me hold my peace. I pray you all, if you have hitherto concealed this sight, let it be tenable in your silence still. And whatsoever else shall hap tonight, give it an understanding, but no tongue. I will requite your loves. So fare you well. Upon the platform, twixt eleven and twelve, I'll visit you. I do, my lord. Your love, as mine to you. Farewell. My father's spirit. In arms. All is not well. I doubt some foul play. Would the night were come. Till then, sit still, my soul. Foul deeds will rise, though all the earth overwhelm them to men's eyes. My necessaries are embarked. Farewell. And sister, as the winds give benefit and convoy is assistant, do not sleep but let me hear from you. Do you doubt that? For Hamlet and the trifling of his favours, hold it a fashion and a toy in blood, a violet in the youth of primy nature, froward, not permanent, sweet, not lasting, the perfume and suppliance of a minute, no more. No more but so? Think it no more. For nature crescent does not grow alone in thews and bulk. But as this temple waxes, the inward service of the mind and soul grows wide withal. Perhaps he loves you now. And now no soil nor cortle doth besmirch the virtue of his will. But you must fear, his greatness weighed, his will is not his own. For he himself is subject to his birth. He may not, as unvalued persons do, carve for himself. For on his choice depends the sanctity and health of this whole state. And therefore must his choice be circumscribed unto the voice and yielding of that body, whereof he is the head. Then if he says he loves you, it fits your wisdom so far to believe it, as he in his particular act and place may give his saying deed, which is no further than the main voice of Denmark goes with all. Then weigh what loss your honour may sustain, if with too credent ear you list his songs or lose your heart, or your chaste treasure open to his unmastered importunity. Fear it, Ophelia. Fear it, my dear sister, and keep within the rear of your affection out of the shot and danger of desire. The cheriest maid is prodigal enough if she unmask her beauty to the moon. <laughs> Virtue itself scapes not calumnious strokes. The canker galls the infants of the spring too oft before their buttons be disclosed. And in the morn and liquid dew of youth, contagious blastments are most imminent. Be wary, then. Best safety lies in fear. Youth to itself rebels, though none else near. I shall the effect of this good lesson keep as watchman to my heart. But good my brother, do not as some ungracious pastors do, show me the steep and thorny way to heaven, whilst like a puffed and reckless libertine, himself the primrose path of dalliance treads, and wrecks not his own reed. Oh, fear me not. I stay too long. Oh, but here my father comes. Ah. A double blessing is a double grace. Occasion smiles upon a second leave. And yet here lay it is aboard, aboard for shame. The wind sits at the shoulder of your sail, and, and you are stayed for. There, my blessing with thee. Uh, and these few precepts in thy memory, see thou character. Give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unproportioned thought his act. Uh, be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. The friends thou hast, and their adoption tried, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel. But do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each unhatched, unfledged comrade. Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bear that the opposed may beware of thee. Give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. Take each man's censure, but reserve thy judgment. Costly thy habit as thy purse can buy, but not expressed in fancy. Rich, not gaudy. 
for the apparel oft proclaims the man, and they in France of the best rank and station, or most select and generous, chief in that. Mm -hmm. Neither a borrower nor a lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. Farewell. My blessing season is in thee. Most humbly do I take my leave, my lord. The time invites you. Go, your servants tend. Farewell, Ophelia. And remember well what I have said to you. It is in my memory locked, and you yourself shall keep the key of it. Farewell. Mm, what is it, Ophelia, he has said to you? So please you, something touching the Lord Hamlet. Mary, well be thought. It is told me he hath very oft of late given private time to you, and you yourself have of your audience been most free and bounteous. If it be so, uh, uh, so it is put on me, uh, uh, that in way of caution, I must tell you, you do not understand yourself so clearly as it behoves my daughter and your honour. What is between you? Give me up the truth. He hath, my lord, of late made many tenders of his affection to me. Affection? Pooh, you speak like a green girl, and sifted in such perilous circumstance. Do you believe his tenders, as you call them? I do not know, my lord, what I should think. Mary, I'll teach you. Think yourself a baby, that you obtain his tenders for true pay, which are not sterling. Tender yourself more dearly. Or, not to crack the wind of the poor phrase, roaming it thus, you tender me a fool. My lord, he hath importuned me with love in honourable fashion. Aye, fashion, you may call it. Go to, go to. And hath given countenance to his speech, my lord, with all the vows of heaven. Aye, springes to catch woodcocks. I do know when the blood burns how prodigal the soul lends the tongue vows. These blazes, daughter, giving more light than heat, extinct in both, even in their promises it is a making, you must not take for fire. From this time be something scanter of your maiden presence. Set your entreatments at a higher rate than a command to parley. For Lord Hamlet believes so much in him that he is young, and with a larger tether may he walk than may be given you. In few, Ophelia, do not believe his vows, for they are brokers. Not of that dye which their investments show, but mere implorators of unholy suits, breathing like sanctified and pious bonds, the better to beguile. This, this is for all. I would not, in plain terms, from this time forth, have you so slander any moment leisure as to give words or talk with the Lord Hamlet. <laughs> Look to it, I charge you. Come your ways. I shall obey, my lord. <laughs> The air bites shrewdly. It is very cold. It is a nipping and an eager air. What hour now? I think it lacks of twelve. It is struck. Indeed? I heard it not. And it draws near the season wherein the spirit held his wont to walk. What does this mean, my lord? The king doth wake tonight takes his rouse, keeps wassail and the swaggering upspring reels, and as he drains his draughts of Rhenish down, the kettle drum and trumpet thus bray out the triumph of his pledge. Is it a custom? I marry is. But to my mind, though I am native here and to the manner born, it is a custom more honoured in the breach than the observance. This heavy-headed rebel, east and west, makes us traduced and taxed of other nations. They keep us drunkards, and with swinish phrase soil our addition. And indeed it takes from our achievements, though performed at height, the pith and marrow of our attribute. So oft it chances in particular men, that for some vicious mole of nature in them, as in their birth, wherein they are not guilty, since nature cannot choose his origin, by the ore growth of some complexion, oft breaking down the pales and faults of reason, or by some habit, that too much o'er leavens the form of plausive manners, that these men, carrying, I say, the stamp of one defect, being nature's livery or fortune's star, their virtues else, be they as pure as grace, as infinite as man may undergo, shall in the general censure take corruption from that particular fault. The dram of evil doth all the noble substance of a doubt to his own scandal. Look, my lord, it comes. Angels, 
and ministers of grace defend us. Be thou a spirit of health, or goblin damned, bring with thee airs from heaven or blasts from hell. Be thy intent wicked or charitable, thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. I'll call thee Hamlet, King, Father, Royal Dane. Oh, answer me. Let me not burst in ignorance, but tell why thy canonized bones, hersed in death, have broke their cerements. Why the sepulchre wherein we saw thee quietly and earned hath oped his ponderous and marble jaws to cast thee up again? What may this mean? That thou, dead course, again in complete steel, revisits thus the glimpses of the moon, making night hideous, and we fools of nature so hurriedly to shake our disposition with thoughts beyond the reaches of our souls. Say, why is this? Wherefore? What should we do? It beckons you to go away with it, as if it's some impartment to desire to you alone. Look, with what courteous action it wafts you to a more removed ground. But do not go with it. No, by no means. It will not speak, then I will follow it. Do not, my lord. Why, what should be the fear? I do not set my life at a pin's fee, and for my soul, what can it do to that, being a thing immortal as itself? It waves me forth again. I'll follow it. What if it tempt you toward the flood, my lord? Or to the dreadful summit of the cliff that beetles o'er his base into the sea, and there assume some other horrible form, which might deprive your sovereignty of reason and draw you into madness? Think of it. The very place puts toys of desperation without more motive into every brain that looks so many fathoms to the sea and hears it roar beneath. It wafts me still. Go on. I'll follow thee. You shall not go, my lord. Hold off your hands. You shall not go. My fate cries out and makes each petty arter in this body as hardy as the Nemean lion's nerve. Still am I called. Unhand me, gentlemen. By heaven, I'll make a ghost of him that lets me. I say, away. Go on. I'll follow thee. He waxes desperate with imagination. Let's follow. It does not fit thus to obey him. Come after. To what issue will this come? Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Heaven will direct it. Hey, let's follow him.
this eternal blazon must not be to ears of flesh and blood. Bliss, Hamlet, oh, list, if thou didst ever thy dear father love, oh, God, revenge his foul and most unnatural murder. Murder! Murder most foul, as in the best it is. Most foul, strange, and unnatural. Haste, haste me to know it, that I with wings as swift as meditation or the thoughts of love may sweep to my revenge. I find thee apt, and duller shouldst thou be than the fat weed that roots itself in ease on lethal wharf. Wouldst thou not stir in this? Now, Hamlet, here, it is given out that sleeping in my orchard, a serpent stung me. So the whole year of Denmark is by a forged process of my death, rankly abused. But no, thou noble youth, the serpent that did sting thy father's life, now wears his crown. Oh, my prophetic soul, mine uncle. Aye, that incestuous, that adulterate beast, with witchcraft of his wits, with traitorous gift, Gifts that have the power so to seduce. One to his shameful lust, the will of my most seeming virtuous queen. Oh, Hamlet, what a falling off is there from me whose love was of that dignity that it went hand in hand even with the vow I made to her in marriage, and to decline upon a wretch whose natural gifts were poor to those of mine. But virtue, as it never will be moved, though lewdness caught it in the shape of heaven, so lust Though to a radiant angel it will sate itself in a celestial bed and prey on garbage. But soft, methinks I sent the morning's air. Brief let me be. Sleeping within my orchard, my custom always in the afternoon. Upon my secure hour, thy uncle stole with the juice of cursed Ebenon in a vial, and in the porches of my ears did pour the leprous distillment, whose effect holds such an enmity with blood of man that swift as quicksilver it courses through the natural gates and alleys of the body. And with a sudden vigor, it doth pass it and curd, like eager droppings into milk, the thin and wholesome blood. So did it mine. And a most instant titter baked about, most lazar-like, with vile and loathsome crust. All my smooth body. Thus was I, sleeping by a brother's hand, life of crown and queen at once dispatched. 
cut off even in the blossoms of my sin. Unhousel, disappointed, down a kneel. No reckoning made, but sent to my account with all my imperfections on my head. Oh. not thy mind, nor let thy soul contrive against thy mother aught. Leave her to heaven, and to those thorns that in her bosom lodge, to prick and sting her. Fare thee well at once. The glowworm shows the matin to be near, and gins to pale is an effectual fire. And you, and you, remember. Shall I couple hell, O oh, fire? Hold my heart, and you my sinews grow not instant old, but bear me stiffly up. Remember thee? I, thou poor ghost, while memory holds a seat in this distracted glow. Remember thee? Yea, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all sores of books, all forms, all pressures past that youth and observation copied there, and thy commandment all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain, unmixed with baser matter. Yes, yes, by heaven, O oh, most pernicious woman, O oh, villain, villain, smiling, damned villain, my tables, my tables. Meet it is, I set it down, that one may smile and smile and be a villain. At least I'm sure it may be so in Denmark. So, uncle, there you are. Now to my word, it is adieu, adieu, remember me. I have sworn it. My lord. My lord? Lord Hamlet! Heaven secure him! So be it. Hello! Hello! Ho! Oh, oh, ho! My lord! Hello! Ho! 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 Boy! Come, bird! Come! How is my noble lord? What news, my lord? How oh, wonderful! Come, my lord, tell it. No, you'll reveal it. Not I, my lord, by heaven. Nor I, my lord. How say you then would heart a man once think it? But you'll be secret. Aye, by heaven, my lord. There's ne'er a villain dwelling in all Denmark, but he's an arrant knave. There need no ghost, my lord, come from the grave to tell us this. Well, right, you're in the right. And so without more circumstance at all, I hold it fit that we shake hands and part. You as your business and desire shall point to you. For every man hath business and desire, such as it is. And for my own part, look you, I'll go pray. These are but wild and whirling words, my lord. I'm sorry they offend you heartily, yes, faith, heartily. There's no offence, my lord. Yes, by St. Patrick, but there is, Horatio. And much offence, too. Touching this vision here, it is an honest ghost, that let me tell you. For your desire to know what is between us, or master it as you may. And now, good friends, as you are friends, scholars, and soldiers, grant me one poor request. What is, my lord? We will... Never make known what you have seen tonight. My lord, we will not. Nay, but swear it. In faith, my lord, not I. Nor I, my lord, in faith. Upon my sword. You have sworn, my lord, already. Indeed, upon my sword, indeed. Swear. Aha, boy. Say so-so, after there, true penny. Come on. 
You hear this fellow in the cellarage? Consent to swear? Propose the oath, my lord. Never to speak of this that you have seen. Swear by my sword. Swear. Be quay, then we'll shift our ground. Come here, the gentleman, and lay your hands upon my sword. Never to speak of this that you have heard. Swear by my sword. Swear. Well said, old mole. Canst work at the ground so fast. Oh, worthy pioneer. Once more, remove, good friends. Oh, dear knight, but this is one restraint. And therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in our philosophy. But come, here as before, never so help you mercy, how strange or odd, so e'er I bear myself, as I perchance hereafter shall think meet to put an antic disposition on, that you at such times seen me never shall with arms encumbered thus, or thus head shake, or by pronouncing of some doubtful phrase, as well we know, or we could, and if we would, or if we list to speak, or there be, and if there might, or such ambiguous giving out to note that you know aught of me, this not to do, so grace and mercy at your most need help you. Swear! Swear! We swear. Rest. Rest, perturbed spirit. So, gentlemen, with all my love, I do commend me to you. And what so poor a man as Hamlet is may do to express his love and friending to you, God willing, shall not lack. Let us go in together. And still your fingers on your lips, I pray. The time is out of joint. Oh, cursed spite, that ever I was born to set it right. May come. Let's go together. Give him this money and these notes, Rinello. I will, my lord. Uh, you shall do marvellous wisely, good Rinello, before you visit him to make inquire of his behaviour. My lord, I did intend it. Very well said, very well said. Look you, sir. Inquire me first what danskers are in Paris, and how and who, what means and where they keep, what company at what expense. And finding by this encompassment and drift of question that they do know my son, come you more nearer than your particular demands will touch it. I take you as to some distant knowledge of him. As thus, I, I know his father and his friends, and in part him. Do you mark this, Ronello? Aye, very well, my lord. And in part him. Uh, but you may say, not well. But if be he, I mean, he's very wild, addicted so-and-so. And there, put on him what forgeries you please. Marry, none so rank as may dishonour him, take heed of that. But, sir, such wanton, wild, and usual slips as our companions noted and most known to youth and liberty. As gaming, my lord? Aye, or drinking, fencing, swearing, quarrelling, trabbing, you may go so far. My lord, that would dishonour him. Faith knows you may season it in the charge. You mustn't put another scandal on him that he is open to incontinency. That's not my meaning, no, but breathe his faults so quaintly that they may seem the taints of liberty, the flesh and outbreak of a fiery mind, a savageness in unreclaimed blood of general assault. But, my good lord... Uh, wherefore should you do this? Aye, my lord, I would know that. The marry, sir, here's my drift, and I believe it is a fetch of warrant. You laying these slight sullies on my son, <laughs> as to a thing a little soiled in the working, Mark you, your party in converse, him you would sound, having ever seen in the predominant crimes the youth you breathe of guilty, be assured he closes with you in this consequence, good sir or so, or friend, or gentleman, according to the phrase in the edition of man and country. Very good, my lord. Uh, and then, sir, does he this? He does? Uh, he, uh, uh, what was I about to say? By the mess, I was about to say something. Well, what, where did I leave? At closes in the consequence, at friend or so. Ah, and gentleman. At closes in the consequence, I marry. He closes with you, us. I know the gentleman. I saw him yesterday or t'other day, or then, or then with such and such. And, as you say, there was he gaming there, or took in his rouse, there falling out at tennis, or, or perchance I saw him enter such a house of sale, uh, vidilis at a brothel, or so forth. See you now. Your bait of falsehood takes this cap of truth. And thus do we of wisdom and of reach with windlasses and with essays of bias by indirections find directions out. So, by my former lecture and advice, shall you, my son. You have me, have you not? Uh, my lord, I have. We run by you, fare you well. Good, my lord. Observe his inclination in yourself. I shall, my lord. And let him play his music. Well, my lord. Fare well. My lord. 
My lord. <laughs> Hello. Ophelia, what's the matter? Alas, my lord, I have been so frightened. With what in the name of heaven? My lord, as I was sewing in my chamber, Lord Hamlet, with his doublet all unbraced, no hat upon his head, his stockings fouled, ungartered, and down jived to his ankle, pale as his shirt, his knees knocking each other, and with a look so piteous in purport, as if he had been lucid out of hell to speak of horrors. He comes before me. Mad for thy love. My lord, I do not know, but truly I do fear it. What said he? He took me by the wrist and held me hard. Then goes he to the length of all his arm, and with his other hand thus o'er his brow he falls to such perusal of my face as he would draw it. Oh. Long stayed he so. At last a little shaking of mine arm, and thrice his head thus waving up and down, he raised a sigh so piteous and profound as it did seem to shatter all his bulk and end his being. Oh, look. That done, he lets me go. And with his head over his shoulder turned, he seemed to find his way without his eyes. For out of doors he went without their help. And to the last bended their light on me. Come, come, go with me. I will go seek the king. This is the very ecstasy of love, whose violent property foredoes itself and leads the will to desperate undertakings as oft as any passion under heaven that does afflict our natures. I'm sorry. What, have you given me many hard words of late? No, my good lord. But as you did command, I did repel his letters and denied his access to me. Now that hath made him mad. I'm sorry that with better heed and judgment I had not quoted him. I feared he did but trifle and meant to wreck thee, but beshrew my jealousy. It seems it is as proper to our age to cast beyond ourselves in our opinions as it is common for the younger sort to lack discretion. Come, go we to the king. This must be known, which being kept close might move more grief to hide than hate to utter love. Come. Welcome, dear Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Moreover, that we much did long to see you, the need we have to use you did provoke our hasty sending. Something have you heard of Hamlet's transformation, so I call it, sith nor the exterior nor the inward man resembles that it was. What should it be more than his father's death that thus hath put him so much from the understanding of himself? I cannot deem of. I entreat you both, that being of so young days brought up with him, and sith so neighboured to his youth and humour, that you vouchsafe your rest here in our court some little time, so by your companies to draw him on to pleasures, and to gather so much as from occasions you may glean, whether aught to us unknown afflicts him thus, that opened lies within our remedy. Good gentlemen, he hath much talked of you, and sure I am two men that are not living to whom he more adheres. If it will please you to show us so much gentry and goodwill as to expend your time with us a while for the supply and profit of our hope, your visitation shall receive such thanks as fits a king's remembrance. Both your majesties might by the sovereign power you have of us put your dread pleasures more into command than to entreaty. We both obey, and here give up ourselves in the full bent to lay our services freely at your feet, to be commanded. Thanks, Rosencrantz and gentle Guildenstern. Thanks, Guildenstern and gentle Rosencrantz. And I beseech you instantly to visit my too much changed son. Go, some of you, and bring these gentlemen where Hamlet is. Heavens make our presence and our practices pleasant and helpful to him. Aye, amen. The ambassadors from Norway, my good lord, are joyfully returned. Thou still has been the father of good news. Yes. Have I, my lord? I assure you, my good liege, I hold my duty as I hold my soul, both to my God and to my gracious king. And I do think, or else this brain of mine hunts not the trail of policy so sure as it hath used to do, that I have found the very cause of Hamlet's lunacy. Oh, speak of that. That do I long to hear. Give first admittance to the ambassadors. My news shall be the fruit to that great feast. Thyself do grace to them, and bring them in. He tells me, my sweet queen, that he hath found the head and source of all your son's distemper. I doubt it is no other but the main. His father's death and our oh, hasty marriage. Well, we shall sift him. Welcome, my good friends. Say, Voltamand, what from our brother Norway? Most fair return of greetings and desires. Upon our first, he sent us to suppress his nephew's levies, which to him appeared to be a preparation against the Polak. 
but better looked into, he truly found it was against your highness. Whereat, grieved that so his sickness, age, and impotence was falsely borne in hand, sends out arrests on Fortinbras, which he, in brief, obeys, receives rebuke from Norway, and in fine makes vow before his uncle never more to give the assay of arms against your majesty. Whereon old Norway, overcome with joy, gives him 3,000 crowns in annual fee and his commission to employ those soldiers so levied as before against the Polak, with an entreaty herein further shown that it might please you to give quiet pass through your dominions for his enterprise, on such regards of safety and alliance as therein are set down. It likes us well. And at our more considered time, we'll read, answer, and think upon this business. Meantime, we thank you for your well-took labor. Go to your rest. At night, we'll feast together. Most welcome home. This business is very well ended. My liege and madam, to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night night, and time is time, were nothing but to waste night day and time. Uh, therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit and tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes, I will be brief. Mm, your noble son is mad. Mad, I call it, for to define true madness what is but to be nothing else but mad. But let that go. More matter with less art. Madam, I swear I use no art at all. That he is mad is true. It is true, it is pity, and, and pity it is true. Oh. A foolish figure, but farewell it, for I will use no art. Mad, let us grant him, then, and now remains that we find out the cause of this effect, or rather say, the cause of this defect. <laughs> For this effect defective comes by cause. Thus it remains, and the remainder thus perpend. I have a daughter, have, while she is mine, who in her duty and obedience Mark hath given me this. Now gather and surmise. Ah. To the celestial and my soul's idol, the most beautified Ophelia, well, that's an ill phrase, a vile phrase, beautified as a vile phrase, but you shall hear. These in her excellent white bosom... Came this from Hamlet to her? Uh, good madam, stay a while, I will be faithful. Doubt thou the stars are fire, doubt that the sun doth move, doubt truth to be a liar, but never doubt I love. Oh, dear Ophelia, I am ill at these numbers, I have not art to reckon my groans, but that I love thee best, O oh, most best, believe it adieu. Thine evermore, most dear lady, whilst this machine is to him, Hamlet. Mm. <laughs> this inobedience hath my daughter showed me, and more above hath his solicitings, as they fell out by time, by means and place, all given to my ear. But how has she received his love? Oh, what do you think of me? As of a man faithful and honourable. I would fain prove so. But what might you think? When I had seen this hot love on the wing as I perceived it, I must tell you that before my daughter told me, what might you, or my dear majesty, your queen here, think if I had played the desk or table book or given my heart a winking, mute and dumb or looked upon this love with idle sight? What might you think? No, I went round to work and my young mistress, thus I did bespeak. Lord Hamlet is a prince out of thy star. This must not be. And then I precepts gave her that she should lock herself from his resort, admit no messengers, receive no tokens. Which done, she took the fruits of my advice, and he, repulsed, a short tale to make, fell into a sadness, then into a fast, thence to a watch, thence into a weakness, thence to a lightness, and by this declension into the madness wherein now he raves and all we wail for. Do you think tis this? It may be, very like. Hath there been such a time, I'd fain know that, that I have positively said, Tis so when it proved otherwise. Not that I know. Take this from this, if this be otherwise. If circumstances lead me, I will find where truth is hid, though it were hid indeed within the centre. How may we try it further? You know, sometimes he walks four hours together here in the lobby. So he does indeed. At such a time, I loose my daughter to him. Be you and I behind an arras, then. Mark the encounter. If he love her not, and be not from his reason fallen thereon, let me be no assistant for a state, but keep a farm and cutters. We will try it. Look where sadly the poor wretch comes reading. Away, I do beseech you. Both away. I'll board him presently. Oh, give me leave. How does my good lord Hamlet? Well, God of mercy. <laughs> do you know me, my lord? Excellent, excellent. Well, you're a fishmonger. Oh, not I, my lord. Uh, then I would you were so honest a man. Honest, my lord? Aye, sir, to be honest as this world goes is to be one man picked out of ten thousand. Oh, that's very true, my lord. For if the sun breed maggots in a dead dog, being a good kissing carrion, have you a daughter? Hmm? I have, my lord. Let her not walk in the sun. 
Conception is a blessing, but not as your daughter may conceive. Friend, look to it. How say you by that? Still harping on my daughter. Yet he knew me not at first. He said I, I, I was a fishmonger. He is far gone, far gone. And truly in my youth I suffered much extremity for love very near this. Uh, I'll speak to him again. What do you read, my lord? Words, words, words. What is the matter, my lord? Between who? No, I mean the matter that you read, my lord. Ah, slanders, sir. For the satirical slave says here that old men have grey beards, that their faces are wrinkled, their eyes purging thick amber or plum tree gum, and that they have a plentiful lack of wit together with weak hams. All which, sir, though I most powerfully and potently believe, yet I hold it not honesty to have it thus set down. For yourself, sir, should be as old as I am, if like a crab you could go backward. Though this be madness, yet there is method in it. Uh, will you walk out of the air, my lord? Into my grave? Indeed, that is out of the air. How pregnant sometimes his replies are. A happiness that often madness hits on, which reason and sanity could not so prosperously be delivered of. I will, I will leave him and suddenly contrive the means of meeting between him and my daughter. My honourable lord, I will most humbly take my leave of you. You cannot, sir, take from me anything that I will more willingly part with all, uh, except my life. Except my life. Oh, fare you well, my lord. These tedious old fools. You go to seek my lord, Hamlet. There he is. God save you, sir. My honoured lord. <laughs> my most dear lord. My excellent <laughs> good friends. <laughs> How dost thou, Gildenstern? <laughs> Our Rosencrans. Good lads. How do ye both? As the indifferent children of the earth. Happy, in that we are not over happy. On fortune's cap, we are not the very button. Nor the soles of her shoe? <laughs> Neither, my lord. Then you live about her waist or in the middle of her favours? Faith, uh, her privates, we. <laughs> in the secret parts of fortune. Oh, most true, she is a strumpet. What's the news? None, my lord, but that the world's grown honest. Then is doomsday near. But your news is not true. Let me question more in particular. What have you, my good friends, deserved at the hands of fortune that she sends you to prison hither? Prison, my lord? Denmark's a prison. <laughs> then is the world one. A goodly one, in which there are many confines, wards and dungeons, Denmark being one of the worst. <laughs> we think not so, my lord. Why, then, tis none to you, for as nothing either good or bad but thinking makes it so. <laughs> to me, it is a prison. Why, then, your ambition makes it one. Tis too narrow for your mind. Oh, God, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space were it not that I have bad dreams. Which dreams indeed are ambition, for the very substance of the ambitious is merely the shadow of a dream. A dream itself is but a shadow. Truly, and I hold ambition of so airy and light a quality that it is but a shadow's shadow. Then are our beggars bodies, and our monarchs and outstretched heroes the beggars' shadows. Shall we to the court for <laughs> by my fay? I cannot reason. We'll wait upon you. <laughs> no such matter. I will not sort you with the rest of my servants. For to speak to you like an honest man, I, I am most dreadfully attended. But in the beaten way of friendship, what make you at Elsinore? To visit you, my lord, no other occasion. Beggar that I am, I am even poor in thanks. But I thank you. And sure, dear friends, my thanks are too dear a hateney. Were you not sent for? Is it your own inclining? Is it a free visitation? Come deal justly with me. Come, come, nay speak. Oh, what should we say, my lord? By anything but to the purpose you were sent for. And there is a kind of confession in your looks which your modesties have not craft enough to colour. I know the good king and queen have sent for you. To what end, my lord? That you must teach me. But let me conjure you. By the rights of our fellowship, by the consonancy of our youth, by the obligation of our ever-preserved love, and by what more, dear, a better proposer could charge you with all, be even and direct with me, whether you were sent for or no. What say you? Nay, then I have an eye of you. If you love me, hold not off. My lord, we were sent for. I'll tell you why. So shall my anticipation prevent your discovery. And your secrecy to the king and queen mold no feather. I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, forgone all custom of exercise. 
And indeed, it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the air, look you, this brave, o'erhanging firmament, this majestical roof, fretted with golden fire, why, it appears no other thing to me than a foul and pestilent congregation of vapours. What a piece of work is man! How noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world, the paragon of animals, and yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights not me. <laughs> no, no woman neither, though by your smiling you seem to say so. My lord, there was no such stuff in my thoughts. Why did you laugh then when I said man delights not me? <laughs> to think, my lord, if you delight not in man, what Lenten entertainment the players shall receive from you. We quoted them on the way, and hither are they coming to offer you service. He that plays the king shall be welcome. His majesty shall have tribute of me. The adventurous knight shall use his foil and target. The lover shall not sigh greatest. The humorous man shall end his part in peace. The clown shall make those laugh whose lungs are tickle of the seer. And the lady shall say her mind freely, or the blank verse shall halt for it. <laughs> what players are they? Even those you were wont to take delight in, the tragedians of the city. How chances it they travel? Their residence, both in reputation and profit, was better both ways. I think their inhibition comes by the means of the late innovation. Do they hold the same estimation they did when I was in the city? Are they so followed? No, indeed they are not. How comes it? Do they grow rusty? Nay, their endeavour keeps in the wonted pace. But there is, sir, uh, an airy of children. Little eye asses that cry out on the top of question and are most tyrannically clapped for it. <laughs> These are now the fashion. And so be rattle the common stages, so they call them, that many wearing rapiers are afraid of goose quills and their scats come thither. What are they, children? Mm -hmm. Who maintains them? How are they escorted? <laughs> Will they pursue the quality no longer than they can sing? <laughs> Will they not say afterwards, if they should grow themselves to common players, as it's most like, if their means are no better, their writers do them wrong to make them exclaim against their own succession? Faith has been much to do on both sides, and the nation holds it no sin to tar them to controversy. There was for a while no money bid for argument unless the poet and the player went to cuffs in the question. It's possible. Oh, there has been much throwing about of brains. Do the boys carry it away? Aye, that they do, my lord. Hercules and his load, too. It is <laughs> not strange, for mine uncle is king of Denmark, and those that would make mouths at him while my father lived give twenty, forty, a hundred ducats apiece for his picture in little. It's blood, there's something in this more than natural if philosophy could find it out. Where are the players? Gentlemen, you are welcome to Elsinore. Your hands come. The appurtenance of welcome is fashion and ceremony. Let me comply with you in the garb. Lest my extent to the players, which I tell you must show fairly outwards, should more appear like entertainment than yours. You are welcome. But my uncle, father, and aunt, mother are deceived. In what, my dear lord? I am but mad north-northwest. When the wind is southerly, I know a hawk from a handsaw. Well be with you, gentlemen. Hark you, Gildenstern, and you too, at each year a hero. That great baby you see there is not yet out of his swaddling clouts. <laughs> Happily is the second time come to them, for they say an old man is twice a child. My lord. <laughs> I will prophesy he comes to tell of the player's market. You say right, sir, on Monday morning, for so indeed. Yeah, my lord, I have news to tell you. Yeah, my lord, I have news to tell you. When Roscius was an actor in Rome... Well, the actors are come hither, my lord. Bus, bus. Upon my honour. Then came each actor on his ass. The best actors in the world, either for tragedy, comedy, history, pastoral, pastoral, comical, historical, pastoral, tragical, historical, tragical, comical, historical, pastoral, scene individable or poem unlimited. Seneca cannot be too heavy nor Plotus too light. For the law of writ and the liberty, these are the only men. Oh, Jephthah, judge of Israel, what a treasure hadst thou. Uh, what a treasure had he By not? one fair daughter and no more, the which he loved passing well. Still on my daughter. Am I not in the right, oh, Jephthah? If you call me Jephthah, my lord, I have a daughter that I love passing well. May that follows now. Well, well, what follows then, my lord? Why, as by lot, God what? <laughs> and then, you know, it came to pass as most like it was. The first row of the pious chansons I'll show you more of. 
Well, look why my abridgments come. You are welcome, masters. Welcome all. I'm glad to see thee well. Welcome, good friends. Ah, oh, my old friend, thy face is balanced since I saw thee last. Comes thou to beard me in Denmark? <laughs> what, thy young lady and mistress? Thy lady, your ladyship is nearer to heaven than when I saw you last by the altitude of a chopping. <laughs> Pray God your voice, like a piece of uncurrent gold, be not cracked within the ring. <laughs> Masters, you're welcome. We lean to it, like French falconers. Fly at anything we see. We'll have a speech straight. Come, give us a taste of your quality. Come, a passionate speech. What speech, my lord? I heard thee speak me a speech once, but was never acted. Or if it was not above once, for the players I remembered, please not the million, twas caveat of the general. But it was as I received it, and others whose judgments in such matters cried in the top of mine. An excellent play, well digested in the scenes, set down with as much modesty as cunning. I remember one said, there were no salads in the lines to make the matter savoury, nor no matter in the phrase that might indict the author of affection, but called it an honest method, as wholesome as sweet, and by very much more handsome than fine. One chief speech in it I chiefly loved, "'Twas Aeneas' tale to Dido, <laughs> and thereabout of it especially where he speaks of Priam's slaughter. If it live in your memory, begin at this line. Uh, let me see it, let me see. Um, the uh, rugged Pyrrhus, like the Acanian beast, um, this is not so, it, it begins with Pyrrhus. <laughs> the rugged Pyrrhus, he whose sable arms, black as his purpose, did the night resemble, when he lay couched in the ominous horse, hath now this dread and black complexion smeared with heraldry more dismal. Uh, 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 head to foot now is he total gules, horridly tricked with blood of fathers, mothers, daughters, sons, baked and impasted with the parching streets, that lend a tyrannous and damned light to their vile murders, roasted in wrath and fire, and this oarsized with coagulate gore, with eyes like carbuncles, the hellish Pyrrhus old grandsire Priam seeks. Oh, for God, my lord, well spoken, with good accent and good discretion. Hmm? Anon he finds him, striking two sorted Greeks. His antique sword, rebellious to his arm, lies where it falls, repugnant to command. Unequal matched, Pyrrhus at Priam drives, in rage strikes wide, but with the whiff and wind of his fell sword, the unnerved father falls. Then senseless Ilium, seeming to feel his blow, with flaming top stoops to his base, and with a hideous crash takes prisoner Pyrrhus' ear. For lo, his sword, which was declining on the milky head of Reverend Priam, seemed in the air to stick. So, as a painted tyrant, Pyrrhus stood, and like a neutral to his will and matter, did nothing. But, as we often see against some storm, a silence in the heavens, the rack stands still, the bold winds speechless, and the awe below as hush as death, and on the dreadful thunder doth rend the region. So, after Pyrrhus pause, a roused vengeance sets him new a work, and never did the Cyclops hammers fall on Mars his armor, forged for proof eternal, with less remorse than Pyrrhus' bleeding sword now falls on Priam. Out, out, thou strumpet fortune! All you gods, in general synod, take away her power. Break all the spokes and fellies from her wheel, and bowl the round knave down the hill of heaven, as low as to the fiend. Oh, this is too long. Get out of the barbers with your beard. Prithee, say on. He's for a jig or a tail of baldry, or he sleeps. Say on. Come to Hecuba. But who? Oh, who had seen the Moblet Queen? The Moblet Queen. Oh, that's good. Moblet Queen is good. Run barefoot up and down, threatening the flame with bison room. A clout about that head where late the diadem stood. And for a robe about her lank and all our timid loins, a blanket in the alarum of fear caught up. Who this had seen, with tongue in venom steeped against fortune's state, would treason have pronounced? But if the gods themselves did see her then, when she saw Pyrrhus, 
make malicious sport in mincing with his sword her husband's limbs. The instant burst of clamor that she made, unless things mortal move them not at all, would have made milch the burning eyes of heaven and passion in the gods. Look where he has not turned his color and his tears in his eyes. Pray you no more. It is well. I'll have thee speak out the rest soon. Good my lord, will you see the players well bestowed? Do you hear? Let them be well used, for they are the abstracts and brief chronicles of the time. After your death, you had better have a bad epitaph than their ill report while you live. My lord, I will use them according to their desert. God's body kins man better. Use every man after his desert, and who should escape whipping? <laughs> use them after your own honor and dignity. The less they deserve, the more merit is in your bounty. Take them in. Come, sirs. Follow him, friends. We'll hear a play tomorrow. My lord. Old friend, can you play the murder of Gonzago? I'm alone. We'll have it tomorrow night. You could, for a need, study a speech of some dozen or sixteen lines, which I would set down and insert in, could you not? I'm alone. Very well. Follow that lord, and look, you mock him not. <laughs> my good friends, I'll leave you till night. You are welcome to Elsinore. Good, my lord. I so. God be with ye. Now I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit that from her working all his visage wand, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit. And all for nothing, for Hecuba. What's Hecuba to him, or he to Hecuba that he should weep for her? What would he do had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have? He would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty and appall the free, confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculty of eyes and ears. Yet I, a dull and muddy metal rascal, peak like John of Dreams, unpregnant of my cause, and can say nothing. No, not for a king, upon whose property and most dear life a damn defeat was made. Am I a coward? Who calls me villain, breaks my pate across, plucks off my beard and blows it in my face, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie in the throat as deep as to the lungs? Who does me this, huh? Why, I should take it, for it cannot be but I am pigeon-livered and lack gall to make oppression bitter. Or ere this, I should have fatted all the region kites with this slave's offal. Bloody, bawdy villain! Remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain! Oh, vengeance! Why, what an ass am I? I sure this is most brave that I, the son of a dear father, murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, must like a whore unpack my heart with words and fall a-cursing like a very drab, a scullion. Fire punt. Ah! About my brain. that guilty creatures sitting at a play have by the very cunning of the scene been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. For murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. 
I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before my uncle. I'll observe his looks. I'll tempt him to the quick. If he but blench, I know my course. The spirit that I have seen may be the devil, and the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape. Yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. <laughs> 